what, um, what we'd like to do here, since we're kind of pressed for time, just have the, we have a couple students that uh, have uh, prepared some pieces for Michael to hear, and uh, after they do that, see if he has any comments or whatever, after that, then it's just an open floor for uh, Q&A, and, and Michael to talk about what he wants to talk about. Uh, what you're going to hear first here is uh, Jeremy Long on alto sax, diplomacy, Nathan Cole, Larry Nelson, Michael Assad on bass. This is a Vincent Herring transcription that Jeremy did, and then uh, also uh, some other stuff. <coughs> this I dig.
to be here. Sorry we were late, by the way. Our bus driver came an hour late and then didn't know where he was going. So it's been a really action-packed day. Um, well, that was uh, enjoyable to listen to. Um, did you transcribe this yourself? Very good. It's kind of very important. If you're, if you're going to do transcriptions, it's, uh, or at least practice transcriptions, it's really important to do it yourself and try to avoid taking it out of a book. Um, and, uh, and you sound really great. And the sound is, is lovely. Um, and the rhythm section was swinging. You know? uh, I mean, I would have frankly preferred to hear you play your own solo. <laughs> you know? But on the other hand, <laughs> Uh, on the other hand, you know, this is a really good way to learn tra transcribing solos. Uh, and I certainly did my share of it, you know. Um, the one thing that was the most important for me in transcription was, it uh, wasn't not even so much the notes. Uh, the notes were fine and dandy, but it was really the rhythm, the time, where to place the notes. Over the uh, over the rhythm section, and that to me is really what distinguishes the greats. Um, and for me, notes are have always been just decoration. I look at it as a little extra decoration, and the real thing is the time. And uh, so, when, when practicing a transcription, I, I'm assuming you did this because it, it sounded like you did that. You play along with the rhythm uh, and try and really get it to lay uh, where the soloist put it, because there's a lot to be learned from that. And also analyze, obviously. You know what the lines are, what's going on, and, and Vincent certainly played a beautiful solo here. Uh, and beyond that, um, you know, you sound great. And what can I say? And keep it up. And uh, and Vincent sounds great too. <laughs> and I guess that's all I have to say. Thank you very much.
not quite sure what to say. Um, uh, this is really a hard piece to play. I'm amazed that you were able to do it. <laughs> and obviously you had to practice it quite a bit to get it, you know, so smoothly under your fingers. Do you have it memorized though? It sounds to me like a lot of this was an improvised piece, and maybe he had little bits of it written out. Uh, but now it has become kind of committed to ink. And uh, I don't know, it sounded great. Uh, the drumming was totally killing. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you're uh, you know, obviously really getting around on the, on the horn. You know, it sounds really, the sound is, is beautiful. And, and, and very fluid and it sounds even. And I can't see what mouth on, so I see what it is. Okay. Um, and yeah, I would have liked also to hear you solo about, excuse me, call me old fashioned. <laughs> but this is really, I, mean, I respect the fact that you spent all this time learning this, and, and it will benefit you. <coughs> all of this will come out in the future, and, you know, when you're improvising, little pieces of it will come out of your subconscious backwards and become part of your style, so it's, you know, it's a really important thing to do. And um, I would like actually to play drums with you, if I could do that. Yeah.
reason I did that, aside from the fact that I love playing drums, um, and I don't get to do it very often, is that uh, just to add a time, to, uh, to underline the importance of time and being a soloist and switching roles with, uh, with another member of the rhythm section. And uh, for me, it's been very useful to play drums to understand how swing is put together and also to be able to switch roles with a saxophonist and understand what makes uh, a drummer feel uh, comfortable playing uh, from a saxophonist viewpoint. And um, those are nice drums, too. Anyway, uh, I'm not sure what level we're all at here and, and even how much time we have, but I just wanted to share a little bit briefly about me and then we'll go into a question thing, I think. Uh, I grew up in Philadelphia. I come from a musical family. My father was a pianist, a jazz pianist, and an attorney in the reverse order. He was really a lawyer, but he loved to play the piano. So, um, and he was a good pianist. So, we played every night after dinner. Uh, that was the activity in my family, it was uh, basketball and jazz. And um, I learned the standards from my dad. And, you know, I grew up listening to Miles and uh, Athelonious Monk. As a matter of fact, in instead of taking us to the baseball game when we were kids, my dad used to take us to concerts. So by the time I was 12 years old, I had heard Count Basie and Duke Ellington. I heard Miles' band a bunch of times. Uh, you know, uh, Dave Brubeck, Jimmy Smith, on and on. Uh, I remember him taking me to a Thelonious Monk concert once when I was about 11 years old. And he explained to me uh, that Monk could, could get sounds out of the piano that nobody else could. You know, and, you know being a kid, I thought he meant that the piano could sound like a chicken. <laughs> but, you know, even at that age, listening from that vantage point, I, was, I understood during the concert what my father was talking about, because Monk had a whole, you know, really coaxed sounds out of the piano that only he could get. Um, eventually, uh, uh, became active. I took up, you know, I began on clarinet, I switched to uh, alto sax, and then moved to, I took a few years off to uh, play sports, and then in high school, got into the tenor saxophone, and, was first exposed, eventually, I was, I was listening to uh, a lot of guys, a lot of particularly blues guys, and uh, also George Coleman and various other saxophonists, <coughs> Sonny Rollins, and eventually was exposed to the music of John Coltrane, uh, which I really didn't like at first. I bought, the first record I bought was uh, uh, Live at Birdland. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, I didn't like it. It, the, his sound sounded too harsh to me, and the drums were too loud. And, uh, but I kept listening to it, and eventually uh, I had sort of a jazz epiphany where I was able to hear it all of a sudden. I understood, you know, I just kept with it. And I started buying some other Coltrane records and just really got, uh, I fell in love with the music. And, uh, and it was somewhere during that point when I was uh, just listening to Coltrane that I decided I wanted to try and be a jazz musician. Uh, I had. Uh, obviously a good role model than my brother Randy, who was three years ahead of me and, uh, and playing trumpet really well. He was already off in college and uh, he had been playing around the Philadelphia area and, and uh, I decided to try my hand at it as well. But it was Coltrane that was really the, the propellant in this, and it was, he was the thing pushing me forward. And uh, I went to Indiana University briefly and then moved to New York City when I was, uh, I just turned 19 years old. And uh, I moved there at a very opportune time because uh, uh, coming from Philadelphia, I also had a lot of R&B roots, and I, I was listening to rock as well as jazz. And, and when I arrived in New York in the, in the late '60s, early '70s, uh, a lot of the barriers between pop music and jazz were were becoming fuzzy, and. Uh, uh, there was a lot of experimenting going on, and I had come out of playing a lot of different styles, so I, I, it was a good time for me to be there. And as far as I was concerned, uh, in terms of saxophone, it was a blank page. And I really used to view it that way. You know, there was all types of music that really, you know, hadn't been developed on the saxophone. You know, it, uh, jazz and bebop, you know, there was a, just a, a, you know, a huge 
a huge amount of saxophone players, you know, going all the way back probably to Sidney Bechet, that had, you know, evolved the music and evolved the instrument, and that was really well covered. But, you know, in terms of rock and R&B, uh, I was able to take what I learned in, in jazz and try and experiment with it in, uh, in R&B, and, and uh, we formed a lot of bands and ended up, uh, ended up in a group called Dreams with my brother and started recording for Columbia Records when I was 20 years old. And uh, it was a real time of experimentation. Um, and the music that we were playing eventually became, you know, there, there was no word for it then. A few years later, they started calling it fusion. Uh, and there were a lot of groups trying that out at the time. Uh, we've, uh, a few years later, I left that band to join Arm Silver for about a year and a half, and then we formed the Brecker Brothers for six, six years, and then on and on. Uh, ended up getting very busy in the studios in New York City, and uh, eventually left that and began going on the road a lot. And um, to make a long story short, I toured, ended up touring with a lot of different groups and a lot of my own groups, and uh, uh, that brings us into the present. That's a uh, quick abridged version. Anyway, uh, before we get to the question thing, uh, I'll just answer a couple of questions that I know that would be asked, you know, uh, in terms of uh, equipment. Uh, and for me, it's completely personal. You know, I have absolutely no, uh, no advice in that matter. Um, and I, you know, just suggest trying to experiment uh, with as many different combinations of mouthpieces and horns as you can and find something that really fits you and feels like you're, that, you know, it feels comfortable. Uh, I've never like gravitated towards equipment based on the way somebody else sounds. It's just, um, you know, try and go, you know, try and go for something that feels comfortable and feels like it could be an extension of, of you. Uh, and, um, you know, it's useful for it to ask for other people's opinion, but you know, in the long run, it's, uh, it doesn't matter so much in terms of sound. If you have really strong convictions about the way you hear something, I would stick with it. Um, I remember I, at one point in New York, I had switched from uh, uh, using an auto link, which I had used for years, I had switched to a Dukoff in the late 70s, and a lot of the saxophone players were criticizing me around the New York area, you know, and telling me to go back to the link. And lo and behold, a couple of years later, most of them were using Dukoffs, you know, and, you know, we all switch around and just, you know, have to kind of stick with your own voice, inner voice. Um, as far as practice routine, it's constantly changing for me. Um, and I rarely at this point have time to get into a real routine because I'm always touring on the road. But when I do have a chunk of time, it's divided up into various areas, and that's constantly changing. But I do believe that practice is extremely important. Um, you know, at least in the craft part of becoming a musician, you know, there's a whole craft area that tips over into art. But it's just, you know, it's, you've got to really be able to play your acts, you know. And, uh, and that's what practicing is all important. And whether it's transcribing, as you heard before, or practicing out of books, or making up your own exercises, which is what I do, or just playing, you know, which is another thing I do. I'll just sit and play, or play with Jake Hayward's old records, whatever it takes, you know. And it's also important to study with a teacher, which I've uh, done off and off, off and on for many, many years. So uh, let's just try and throw this up to uh, questions. Hi, Hans. Yeah. Um there's obviously a lot of saxophones here, and, and the reason why I use that, that Bob Minster dual piece for um, transcription and practice, and Brothers do the saxophone chord, is it's kind of a springboard uh, for uh, alternate fingerings and overtones and, and that kind of thing. And I think it was in your, in your latest Jazz Times um, interview, you talked about how you went through a long practice period with Walt Weisskopf's exercises. Could you kind of detail how and what and when, why did you practice? Well, I mean, especially because with the Delta City Blues. Oh, okay. Um, that's, that's kind of hard to, uh, uh, I definitely, you know, 
most of my serious practicing years were, were was when I was much younger, when I was really putting in you know, large, long hours. Um, but I still practice uh, at home. It's just not, it's not, um, you know, there's no real water to it. I practice when I have time to do it. And I did go through a Walt Weisskopf phase. I just, you know, I just fell in love with a lot of his records and I kind of analyzed um, what he was doing without, I didn't transcribe any of the solos, but I sort of figured it out. And then it turns out he had a book published, which I subsequently got, and that kind of corresponded to what I, what I had already figured out. But that really wasn't related to Delta City Blues. There was another blues that I wrote that was based, you know, loosely on, on Walt's thing, to, uh, Walt's concept of triads. Uh, also, there's a gentleman named Gary Campbell, you probably know, that, uh, that's coming out with a book that has a lot of the same stuff in it. And um, Delta City Blues just came from messing around. Uh, I, I like to just sit home and, uh, when I have time and, and experiment with the instrument, with, you know, alternate fingerings. <coughs> and things just come to me. That one just fell on my lap. Uh, it just, you know, it almost didn't come from me. It was just presented. You know, it came out of the air. Uh, uh, I, that particular day, I was, I don't know what I was, I think I was experimenting with overtones, and I just, Do you remember uh, back with Joe Allen, uh, specific exercises or anything that you Uh Yeah, he did have me do specific overtone exercises. Um, I remember a lot of it being uh, working with overtones, uh, going up and coming down uh, as, a, as a means to freeing the larynx. It was all based on larynx. Uh, the freedom of the larynx, much as the way the vocal cords move. And um, um, and at the same time, trying to keep all the other elements fairly still. Uh, you know, trying to keep the upper lip as loose as possible, which was a Joe thing, uh, which frees up the back of the larynx as well. And uh, and being able to keep the mouthpiece sort of fluid and not glued tight, not tightening any of the muscles, and, and leaving the. Uh, um, larynx to be open and free. Uh, and the overtone exercises that I practiced with Joe were really instrumental in that. And the overtones are fun. I mean, any, any sound you can get out of the saxophone is different. That's why I, I like um, James Carter so much, because he's created a whole new, uh, for me, a whole new bunch of colors on the instrument that I didn't even know were possible. And uh, I enjoy sitting around and, and practicing and just kind of coming up with uh, things that can be implemented in some other uh, compositional fashion, like Delta City Blues, you know, and I have, I have a bunch of them at home that I'm working on. Uh, practice, practicing should be fun, you know. Um, and the sax is a neat instrument because it's just so free. You know, there really aren't, aren't that many rules. Nobody really sounds alike on it. You know, we kind of sound the way we sometimes sound the way we look even, you know. Uh, and it's such a complicated waveform, you know, that it can't be can't be uh, duplicated really very well by a synthesizer. And, and no two people ever really sound the same. And uh, uh, the difficulty of that is that there's so much that can be played on the instrument, and coming up with your own set of ideas can be daunting. You know, and uh, the, the trick is really just to stick with it and to keep playing with other musicians and preferably to play with musicians that are better than you, uh, which is what I do constantly. The band that I brought here, uh, they're all better than me. But it keeps me, you know, it, it keeps me, it keeps me propelling forward, keep, I keep, you know, it keeps me wanting to learn new things. I get inspired by the guys I'm playing with. And, uh, and, I, and I play better when I play with people that, you know, I feel are better musicians, you know. Uh, or at least broader musicians. Yes. Thanks, Klaus. Anybody else want to chime in? Yes, sir. What was the name of that album? The Walt Weiss album was, actually it wasn't his album, it was an album that he played on. Yeah, it was a Snyder album. Yeah, there we go. You know, lately I've just been listening to opera. That's, you know, I just kind of go with, 
have become really an enamored with Pavarotti, <coughs> particularly in the phase in the 70s, Puccini, and that's sort of having a little influence on the way I'm playing. It's constantly changing. Uh, today I heard something on the bus by Keith Jarrett that just floored me on the way over here, and, and frankly inspired the hell out of me. It just it, it seemed to open another door a few inches. So I'm going to delve into that a little bit. Um, but I get tremendously inspired by the saxophonists as well. Walt is a good example. I mean, there's so many guys that I think plays just so incredibly well. And, um, and I enjoy the sound of the instrument. Yes. I did bring it, but, uh, yeah, I've uh, been playing tonight, yeah, I don't think we have that much time, but I'll be playing quite a bit tonight. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. When you're in the process of soloing, like, during, just during a concert or something, what do you think about? I mean, do you think about communicating something? Are you thinking about patterns you might use? Or are you trying to keep your mind clear of thinking? Uh, it's, there's no one thing for me, as I'm sure there isn't for you. Uh, I'm mostly trying to just stay in the present and listen. Uh, you know, you just like to have a good working knowledge of what I'm going to be playing. And, um, Sometimes I'll have a preconception of how I want to approach a solo, but most of the time it's just uh, really trying to stay in the present and listening you know, as closely as I can to what's going on around me. I'm very dependent on drummers, uh, extremely dependent on the drums, and I seem to like to play with conversationalist type drummers that are constantly feeding me rhythms. And, uh, um, And out of that, a lot of it is subconscious. Uh, and it's, you know, when I'm really playing well, uh, it feels like I'm not the one playing. And a lot of that is dependent on factors that I don't really understand, and, uh, that none of us really understand. But you know, it, it does help to have good acoustics and have a, a group of musicians that I'm playing with it, uh, where there's a really you know close chemistry. And um, I'm familiar with the harmony, obviously, uh, but I'm trying not to think a whole lot while I'm playing. You know, it's, it's some other process that takes over. I am very aware of the time, though, at all times, uh, and where the notes are being put, and what's going on behind me. <coughs> and, you know, as I said, I can't stress the rhythm, the rhythmic part of it more. You know, I'm, you know, I have a tendency to rush, so I'm always trying to not rush. Um, and that's about it. Uh, I try also to listen to the bass, which doesn't come natural for me when I'm playing. I try and be, you know, aware of what's going on in the bass. There are times when I'll have an idea that I want to try, something that I've been working on, uh, that, I, that I want to try and get it out. Often when I do that, it, it sounds premeditated and forced. Um, and if, it, if I've been practicing well, the ideas come out subconsciously and uh, come out in much more interesting ways. I'm sort of a, uh, my practice when I practice it involves exercises that I make up. And I keep a notebook, which I've been doing for years, you know. And I, I date it. I always date. When I come up with an idea, something that, that sounds like I can use in some context, um, I learn it in every key. First chromatically, then in whole steps, then in minor thirds, then in major thirds, uh, and sometimes in fourths and fifths and in tritones. And uh, I work on different inversions of it, constantly 
then trying to think of the notes. That's what I'm thinking. That's what is the thinking process when I'm home, practicing exercises, and um, inverting them. And this helps me to be able to play in different keys. It helps me to get around on the instrument and gives me food for, it's almost like learning the words of a language. It gives me new sentences and new words. The intention of which is not to play the exercise in a solo, but to take clips of it and mess it up. You know, to really understand what I'm doing and then what I'm playing, to just take little words out of the sentences that I've learned and, and throw them in and invert them. And uh, that's the way I learned how to, uh, that was just my approach to soloing. That's where the, uh, the vocabulary came from, as well as transcribing. You know, I've often said that you know 80% of what I play, uh, or if not more, comes from from all the people that I listen to. You know, there's so much that I got from Coltrane, from Joe Henderson, from Sonny Rollins, uh, and Bird, and guitar players and trumpet players. You know, and um, and then the rest of it is like just stuff that I practice, and then just being in the present and playing a lot. You know, and eventually it ends up you know kind of melding together into a sort of a singular voice that has obviously come very strongly from people behind me. Uh, when I, I'm asked by students or younger, uh, you know, younger musicians, how they, you know, what, what should they practice and how, how can they sound like me? I always tell them to go listen to Train, you know, Joe Henderson and uh, Freddie Hubbard and Miles, uh, because that's what, you know, that's what I'm coming out of. But I also believe that, you know, that I, I kind of had a singular voice at this time that, you know, has kind of developed just from playing a lot and putting in a lot of hours, you know, either practicing or sitting at the piano or thinking about music. And uh, also, you know, other hours just kind of living. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and all that seems to uh, help mold a style. Hope that answers the question. Some reason. 
I forget what the fear was, as well as the fact that he made a record uh, during that time, I think it was called The Word of Mouth Man, where he, and he also wasn't allowed to list who was in the band. Uh, Herbie was on it, Wayne was on it, uh, I was on it, and I think Bob Windsor, I don't know, I, I forget, I don't know who was on it because it wasn't listed. <laughs> um, but we did this gig at the club and it was packed. We played three nights and it was just standing and it was packed. And we, well, we weren't allowed to advertise it as well, I don't know if I mentioned that, but uh, people showed up just purely through word of mouth. So John Bo called it the word of mouth band. And shortly after that, uh, we had this gig in Florida. We all flew down to do it. And it was mostly, you know, the big band was with a big band, and it was Florida musicians, and Bob Mincer and myself, and a few other people flew down with John Crow. And I seem to recall that it was a present for his mother. He had a recording truck outside. It was a 24 track uh, truck. And there was no intention to ever release a record from it. I, somehow, my memory, if my memory serves me right, it was a, supposed to be a record for his mom's, as he put it, for my mom's. And uh, uh, it was a fun night. I think it was only, was it one night or two nights? I don't remember. Um, and uh, the reason it was a, a kind of a, a, a crazy night for me is that I checked into a rehab the next day in Florida. That was my last night in, in 1981. That was my last chemically dependent night. Um, and then that next morning I went into a rehab for two months and completely withdrew from the scene, from the music scene, from everything. Didn't play for two months and just addressed that part of my life that was completely, had gone completely crazy. So that was a very important day for me. Uh, and I never expected the record to be released. And, uh, uh, it was remixed by James Farmer and, and Peter. Uh, you know, it was released obviously sub subsequently to John Crow's untimely passing. And uh, it was one of the few recordings left that was done on a 24 track. That, uh, I mean, at the time I looked at it as a complete, just, you know, maniacal bash out night, just a complete frenzy. And, uh, but I think there was a lot of good music on it. I had, actually had the original tapes, the whole thing from the game. Uh, stuff that didn't make the record, and, and, it's, and it came out really pretty nice. And I thought it was a good, uh, another good remind, reminder. John was, was still playing at that time, so there was a lot of good music on there. Some great Bob Mintz were on there, and uh, uh, so I'm, I'm, you know, proud to be on that record, even though I was not in, in the best shape at that time. And I cringed when I first heard it was going to come out because I, I was, I was completely out of it that night. Yeah. But in retrospect, I'm glad it was released. To answer your question. <laughs> yes, sir. You know, um, in terms of the music that you listen to as far as my first time, do you think it's important that you feel strong or you feel so you listen to? Do you think it's important that you feel be selected from all the things that you listen to as far as what is it? I think it does make a difference. Uh, when I listen to, to uh, bad music, it just it makes me feel weak. I don't know how else to put that. Uh, I try and listen to things that inspire me, you know, or, or just uplift me in some way, or show me possibilities, um, or music just that I like. Uh, so that you know, I filter. I do filter out things. You know, when I'm sitting in the car, which is probably my favorite listening place particularly since they started playing CD players in cars. Uh, if I have the radio on, it's very hard for me. I'm filtering, I'm filtering my ass off. You know? <laughs> uh, and it's tough, because I don't hear much, much good things on the radio. Uh, there's some, a couple of good jazz stations in New York um, that, that play fantastic things. They'll have, you know, Charlie Parker, uh, uh, just two days devoted to Charlie Parker, or Train, or, or you know, Jimi Hendrix, or, uh, you know, on, on, on. Uh, I have trouble with a lot of fusion music. I generally filter that out because, uh, in spite of the fact there are good musical elements and some some fusion is done really well, it, it just puts me to sleep. Uh, I'd rather listen to pop music 
So, you know, often I'm listening to the, if I have my kids in the car, I'm listening to the station called Z100, where I'm listening to the top 40, which lately is kind of undergoing kind of a renaissance. It's, you know, there's been some good music in there. Uh, other than that, I bring CDs in the car and uh, um, either listen to things from the, you know, 40s, 50s, and 60s, or listen to new things that I bought, uh, or classical music. Uh, but I do filter, you know, so I, you know, I, I, it's like filming, I'm trying to eat good food. Uh, it definitely has an effect on the way I feel. And, and um, that was important for me, for instance, to stop doing TV commercials. Uh, I finally just said, I can't do it. Because uh, I didn't like where it put in my head. Um, it was, you know, mostly bad music written by, uh, you know, not such good arrangers. Occasionally some good arrangers would be right, right just because they needed the bread. Um, but I didn't like the way I felt after I came out of a TV commercial. You know, I just felt like putting on the TV or something. I just kind of killed, it was killing me on some, on some level. So I, you know, somewhere in the early years, I just said, that's it. Uh, and it was hard to say no to the money, but uh, I felt that it was having a, a, an impact on some level of creativity. So yeah, I think so. Um, and, uh, you know, listening is really important. And I wish I could listen more. Like this, this Keith thing killed me today. This is just this one tune that Keith Jarrett wrote that it just, you know, was so inspiring. Uh, thanks for your question. I noticed that in your last few albums you seem to be moving towards straight ahead jazz and moving away from the well, um, I've never made a real big distinction. Well, there is a big distinction, let me clarify that, between jazz and electric. I like good music. I like good creative music. If it's electric, it doesn't phase me, as long as it's coming from the heart and, there's, and, you know, and, and it's adventurous and it's kind of you know, pushing towards the edge, you know, whether rhythmically, harmonically. Um, if it's open, and well composed, uh, whether it's ele electric or whether it's acoustic. Um, you know, I've always gone, as you know, between both various mixtures of both. From the group steps ahead, we were half electric, half acoustic. I don't know, we began as acoustic, it became electric. My own original band was, was an amalgam of electric and acoustic. Uh, you know, playing. Uh, I was playing a lot of Iwi at the time. Uh, I was, you know, and really enjoying programming synthesizers. At the same time, right now, I'm playing acoustically. Just, it was a, uh, it was kind of a reaction to the, the last Brecker Brothers band, which was very, very electric. Uh, we did two albums in 1992 and 94, and did a lot of touring. And I felt like I just wanted to get back to playing with the quartet for a while, uh, and just play the tenor. And, you know, that's not to say that two years from now that's what I'm going to be doing. I'm actually getting an inkling now of changing up a little bit. I'm beginning to get a little itchy. You know, as much as I'm enjoying what I'm doing, I've been uh, having some ideas that have uh, been, been presented with ideas uh, that are possibly going to take me in another direction. Um, I love acoustic music. Uh, I love electric music. It's, just, it's been, never been a big deal for me. I'm very much the way Harvey is, Harvey Hancock and I have talked about it a lot. Uh, in a certain way, I've never felt complete with just one or the other. Uh, I've heard Harvey saying that once, and I totally agreed. Um, I'm not, you know, I've never been a purist that way. Um, I've been so inspired by Mother Report, you know, uh, and musicians like Jocko, or, you know, something great, you know. Um, pop musicians as well. Thank you.
soul instruments intermesh to create an elasticity that just feels good. You know, it either feels good or it don't. Um, and you know, it's, you know, it don't mean a thing to the old saying, don't mean a thing to the that's one. Or as Elvin Jones once said, if it don't feel good, why bother? And he was talking in musical terms. Um, I visualize the beat as a, as, a, as a wide beat. And I see it almost like as a, as a rainbow, as this kind of a spectrum. And the note, as a soloist, can be placed anywhere in that wide beat. Now, one can play on top, can play behind, can play both ways, uh, you know, can play down the middle. Uh, and I've practiced all, all ways of trying to do that. Um, and really, you know, great masters of that. For instance, like a good, a good example uh, is Dave Liebman, who's you know, one of my favorite musicians in the world. And, and he has the ability to play, you know, almost, un, you know, it's, it's incredibly related to the time, but he doesn't play eighth notes. He has a way of just weaving that is like magic. You know, and he has spent a lot of time thinking about rhythm and time to come up with a way of playing. To me, it's entirely his own. It's a, the rhythm itself is his own language. Um, so I, you know, I'm concerned with swing and, uh, but without being able to completely articulate what what is that creates that. Uh, I don't know if anybody can. But it is, I know, a certain kind of tension, release, related elasticity that happens that, uh, that the really masterful players are aware of, extremely aware of, and concerned with. I'll never forget, um, in 1976, I was playing on a record, uh, it was a drummer's record, a very well-known drummer, and, uh, and uh, two horns were Freddie Hubbard and myself. And I'd gotten to know Freddie pretty well, and I, 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 he's my idol. Uh, I just, I, I, you know, I'm a total Freddie Hubbard fan. I just, I think he's amazing. And uh, and I always wondered, you know, because Freddie has this amazing sense of time. And he, uh, he's a very few trumpet players can swing that hard. Uh, I always wondered whether he thought about it or not, whether maybe he was just going with it, you know, or maybe he got it as a, as a kid, or, Maybe it was a cultural thing, or was it in his genes, or did he think about it, or is he concerned, you know? And uh, I remember that it was a good rhythm section. Uh, Ron Carter was on the date, and, uh, uh, but something was wrong with the time, and I wasn't that aware of it, but Freddie was just bought the whole session, and he kept whispering to me, you know, in my ears, he kept saying, you know, this rhythm section is messed up. And, uh, and it sounded okay to me, but it was bothering him. He was having trouble. He was very succinctly aware of what was happening in the rhythm section because he said it a bunch of times to me. And I thought that was great. From those few little moments, I learned a lot. And he was extremely uh, aware of what was happening and the way it was making him lay his, you know, his lines. And, uh, and he was very aware of a lot of things. Um, and uh, I actually saved the outtakes. The Freddie was in such good form that day that I saved all the outtakes. I had them in somewhere at home. You know, I was of course on, on uh, cloud nine. I played with him a bunch of times, but this one, this was some really good Freddie. And I like the fact that he uh, you know, uh, was sort of sharing with me just things he was feeling, you know, about the rhythms. And he's very concerned with it, as are uh, you know the really great players. You know, they're careful when they, when they, you know, if, they, if, if they're clear, they're very careful about who they put in the rhythm sections. And, and where do you think you are in your time? In the time thing, I play on top. Uh, I always have. I have to, you know, force myself to, you know, to be cognizant of the whole, that whole, you know, I'm capable of playing in various ways, but I naturally gravitate towards the top of the beat. Um, which doesn't happen when I play drums. It's not that bad. I don't know what that is. But, uh, um, the drumming certainly helped. I, the, I got um, 
sort of a, I have no drum technique at all, but I have a certain degree of independence and understanding of the way that jazz is played on drums. When I was in high school, I used to play drums every day and listen to Elvin. Uh, and uh, so I kept that up you know, in my early years in New York, and I, I occasionally used to even do gigs on drums. I, mean, I can't do it at all now because I, I have no technique, technique left. Um, but that gave me a good confidence in terms of rhythm. I, I do have a degree. Uh, I've never been a good, uh, never been naturally good at playing in odd times. That takes, I have to practice that. Or when I have odd bars inserted. You know, I know guys that are amazing at that, they're like mathematicians. You know, it takes me a while to get the knack of that. Uh, but in terms of basic swing and uh, being able to lay notes over the rhythm section, I feel fairly confident about that. And have really, you know, for a long time. I know a lot of it is a result of the drumming. And also, uh, Dave Liebman, I, I remember years ago, uh, he's been very helpful to me uh, over the years. I remember once when I was about 23 years old, he told me that my time stuck. And uh, I might have been a little younger, but I didn't really know what he meant. And of course, he didn't, he didn't quite phrase it that way. But, um, he got me thinking about it. Uh, we talked a little about it, and I really focused on uh, on where I was laying notes, on where I was putting the notes. And I remember a few years later, I played in a tape. I was in his loft in New York, and we were hanging out, and I brought a tape of something that I had done. And he sat and listened to it, and he looked at me and said, your time is too good now. Meaning that, okay, all right, all right. <laughs> Um, and, uh, yeah, what he was telling me at that time was to free up a little bit, you know. I, I was playing like a machine gun at that point, you know. And he was telling me that, you know, okay, all right. You know, and, um, uh, uh... Have you gotten to play uh, with Dave on drums? Yeah, uh, Dave actually plays a lot of drums. He's coming out, he plays like free drums, and you know, he's, a, he's actually a great drummer. Um, most of the saxophone players I know play drums. And it's just a coincidence, just we all, you know, most of the guys I know, they're really good Who's players. The best sax drummer? The best sax drummer? I don't know. Good question. Oh, you're a drummer too? <laughs> I think my favorite non musician, non drummer drummer is Chick Corea, who's a fabulous drummer. Uh, he really studied uh, Philly Joe, Jimmy Cobb, and then when his chops were up, uh, he, you know, he was really a great drummer. Did a lot of that just kind of spring from the whole off scene? Well, not for me, but I think for some guys it did. Uh, we were all changing instruments a lot. Uh, for me, the drums just, uh, I, it sprang from loving Elvin Jones and Tony Williams. I used to practice with Tony every day when I was in high school. Come home, have milk and cookies, play basketball. This is my routine. Play basketball, and they were with full court. The next time, they full court by now, so we'd have serious games. And then I put on a record and played with uh, Tony Williams on four and more, and really trying to get the symbol happening. And this is actually not a normal high school guy here. But uh, that, and then I play along with this record called Unity with Larry Young, and that was some of the best album ever, and I play with that every day. Uh, and then when I got to New York, I you know, discovered there were other musicians that were. Really interested in the rhythm and drums and all that stuff. Um, um, trying to think. Uh, Joe Bogonzi is an excellent drummer. Uh, uh, there's a lot. It's, it's funny. It's a weird. And it's. Mm -hmm. Joe Lovano plays great drums. Bob Burke's a good drummer. Uh, uh, Steve Grossman used to play great drums. He played, he played great everything. He's a great bass player. He played really good piano. Uh, it's helpful to play other instruments, just to, uh, to broaden our minds. And, uh, and the, over the last couple of years, I've been learning uh, kungas. Uh, and I actually had to stop for a while because it was, it was hurting my hands really bad. I couldn't bend my fingers. But I realized that you know, I've been playing with percussionists a lot all throughout my career, but I had no idea what they were doing. And I finally just said, okay, that's it. And I went out and got a bunch of videos.
videos and started just started, you know, from the beginning trying to, you know, learn the rhythms, which I, I managed to do. I, I don't play it well. I can't get a good slap. But you know, I can play probably 20 different rhythms and play, play, play them decently. Uh, I just wanted to know what it was. I wanted to know the difference between the song and the moment. And probably that'll help somewhere along the line. And once helped when I've been composing it, I've gotten ideas uh, from the rhythms. I just love rhythm. Uh, it, it just reaches me right in my heart. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know who the best saxophone drummer is. Though. Probably me. No. <laughs> Whether that's going to translate 
into great artists. We don't know yet. There have been a few really good ones. Um, but it's certainly keeping the music alive and it's keeping it vibrant. Um, and I think um, on some level there's always going to be a lot of people, you know, not a mass audience, but there's going to be enough people to be able to keep it alive uh, that appreciate hearing good instrumentalists um, and imaginative ideas presented by good instrumentalists on an artistic level. Uh, jazz, in a certain way, is kind of becoming classical music. You know, it's being notated, uh, uh, it's being taught almost in a similar way. Um, as even we looked, as I, as I experienced today, seeing um, uh, these two pieces perform, you know, note for note with the rhythm section, which I actually had never seen before, and I, I, I didn't want to play that way. Um, but I think it's a good approach. Um, and so I think the future is bright. I don't think jazz is going to die. I mean, it used to be the, the question is jazz dead. I think creative music is always going to be alive. And, uh, it's, it's, and it's growing. Whether somebody can make a living from it, I don't know. I've been very fortunate. Uh, you know, I've just been really, really lucky to be able to keep maintaining, you know, uh, to be able to make a living and, uh, and be able to play creatively. You know, without any real barriers. So it can be done. Good question. I don't know if I answered that. Um, it is a daunting task, though, being a professional musician, uh, being self employed, and trying to be uh, you know, creative at the same time and make ends meet uh, in a culture that, you know, that doesn't reward it greatly. Um, it's, a, it's a daunting task, but it can be done and there are people doing it you know, on many different levels. And it's tremendously rewarding, uh, if not financially in other ways. just 
wrecked the record and picking it up and, uh, in, in the days of vinyl. Uh, and, and trying to figure it out. I didn't always even figure it out correctly, but it was just somehow the act of doing it and getting my ear trained uh, to the best of my ability. It, you know, it, it created a, a forward kind of motion. Um, um, so, I haven't really thought about, you know, writing uh, a book. On the other hand, that could change. I have actually been doing some writing lately and find out that I'm not as bad as that I thought I was. Um, so, you know, eventually down the line there might be some kind of concept thing coming out, uh, you know, some kind of thing that would come out of me. I'm not quite sure what that be, would be, but um, there may be a book about art or something. Or, but not so much about finding things or things I practice and stuff. That's, you know, that's all, almost, it's almost like personal. I, I don't mind teaching it on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, but the rest of it, I think, is maybe better left to the imagination. I could be wrong. Um, uh, does anybody, how does somebody else feel? Actually, how do you feel about that one? I'd be curious. Yeah, or just too much literature out there. It's good that it's there, but right. you've got to use it as a tool. Right. It shouldn't be all and, and, and yeah. but I mean, we as you know, consumers and physicians would love to see something. So you have to say Yeah. Uh, so I guess there's some between because it is good that it's there. I can't negate that it's, it's it's all of these tools are fantastic. Um, the question is, yeah, if you rely on it too much, then you're gonna be uh, kind of uh, stamping out your own individuality. Or it's harder to erase if you learn too much of this stuff. It's almost harder to erase it from the subconscious, and, you know. So when you date everything that you write down in your practice, yes. you that for your own? That's for my own. Oh, I told I date it only just because it sort of formalizes it. Okay. And I can go back, because I forget my brain. I wouldn't believe what I forget. <laughs> um, you know, it's almost like I have no brain cells left. I did it to, to and I go back um, and sometimes we'll review things that I've learned because I've completely forgotten them. And they're still in there, um, but I need just that extra jolt I'll look at and I say, oh, that, whatever happened to that? Yeah, no, I would never put that out. <laughs> yeah. Because that's the process. Um, and the stuff that comes out is called sort of the records and, the, and the, I guess the transcriptions or something. But the process is, uh, is you know, these are no great, oh, by the way, these ideas are no great ideas. They're just things that appeal to me. Um, they're no, uh, they're, uh, some of them are incredibly inane. Um, you know, a series of two or three notes even. But uh, something that I feel like I can use as a, as a piece and that's what sort of creates, you know, me. But I wouldn't want to hoist that on somebody else, you know, because somebody else might come up with a whole. They would spend time. Somebody would spend time learning that, but I wouldn't want them to, you know, it's, you know, it's like stay away from that. And, and, but pick some notes that are, you know, it's more the process of pick some notes that you like, that really speak to you. It could be, uh, you know, I'll, let me demonstrate one. I have my horn. Hey. Back on this. Where is it? Oh, there you are. Uh, so you wake up one day and you're getting ready to practice, or the night before you were in the shower, or you were washing dishes, or studying, or whatever it is, and uh, you heard, or you were listening to something, you heard a couple of notes that, that you 
you like, just for instance, I'll pick any notes. <laughs>
this way of practicing music is incredible. Um, and back in those days, he used to be able to play things that were unimaginable. Um, coming out of exercises like this, uh, the, the trick is, you know, is, is to be able to, in, in, you know, incorporate these kind of ideas without losing the swing. Um, and that's a challenge. Uh, but that's what I get a lot of the vocabulary. Uh, was that your question? Yeah, I hope that answers that. And so I date it as well because I forget things. Um, it's not dating it to present it in a book later. They, a lot of these I'd be embarrassed for anybody to see. <laughs> Could you give us a, a preview of the old city blues book? Ew. <laughs> <laughs> Flats, you know, the whoa, are done with the side keys. Okay. Yeah. Makes it easier. I knew when we were going to be flat that it had to be the but I couldn't hear that. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Two 
actually, this time I was starting with the alternate. Like going alternate, regular, regular, alternate, alternate, regular. Um, there's no system to it. And it's just, you know, silliness, just sitting at home, uh, just kind of letting my mind wander. That one, that, I forget why and where that came from. But I've gotten a lot of use out of it. <laughs> <laughs> The quarter tone, there's some quarter tone stuff that you notated in there. Um, that, mm -hmm. yes, that is, I see you have written half covered. No. It's, uh, there's two things that I do. Uh, there's the quarter tone fingerings that I worked out, um, half of which I've forgotten, but there was a time when I had a quarter tone finger. I told you I forget, it's unbelievable. But I had a quarter of them for every. I just sat around one day, and, and you know, actually that took me a while. And because I was enamored by the way blues guitar players could always get right between the major third and the minor third, and I wanted the sax to do that without having to lip it. You know, instead of. Uh, I'm constantly looking. 
I just got hold of the balance, super balance, the man in the room, and hoping that that's going to because it feels so much of this. Any interest in the soprano? I was interested in the soprano, uh, and I played a little at home. I want to study it classically first, I think. I think I want to have to do that before I. You, you mentioned that you're interested in the new opera. You have a role for opera, and you know what we can just record it. He told me. But he yeah, recorded a, a Puccini thing. Yeah. Um, the closest I've gotten recently was I actually brought the soprano. I was getting ready to go. I was going to the airport on tour, and I brought the soprano in the cab to the airport, along with all my other stuff. And as I was getting out, I looked at it and I told the cab driver to take it back home. <laughs> <laughs> It almost came with me. It really came close. I have recorded with it a little bit. You know, I've recorded recently with her. You know. The actually, the reason, the only reason I brought that is because I wanted me to play Ewe, and I didn't think it was going to fit in that context, so I brought the soprano. Uh, but I've never really sat and practiced it. And uh, part of that is that it, it's, it's, I have a little problem with my neck, and uh, it requires a. Uh, uh, the amount of resistance it takes sometimes hurts. Uh, so I don't know. But I think some of the soprano will be the tech, I hope. Um, the iwi actually took, it really filled that spot for me for a long time. But now that I'm not playing, I'm finding the desire when I have a, have a switch of color. And maybe the iwi will return. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes. Play.
I've been picking certain tunes now, and like that, like around midnight, I used to be able to play those arpeggios within the tune. This is just, this is the, the way I work. Um, it's very it's fairly tedious, time consuming, but the end result is kind of neat. And I'm gonna keep practicing those until I can actually get it through a whole tune, and then uh, and hopefully be able to play the melody and the arpeggios together. Um, that's, you know, it's just the way I think the best. So, um, uh, it's not totally improvising per se, but it's built on elements of of, uh, of sort of free associating as well. Repeated notes alternate fingerings within the arpeggios. Otherwise, it just sounds like you know, it's what that's what creates the sound is the is the uh, alternate fingerings. Um, And the tune is just an excuse to play the, the alternate fingerings. <laughs> um, but that needs a lot of work. This is in the infant stage, and hopefully by next year I'll be able to record something that has that in it. Uh, all of this stuff, by the way, uh, uh, you know, it's all very slow. Let's see you later. Uh, it's, uh, the process of growth for me is extremely slow. Uh, so if you experience that same thing, don't get discouraged. Uh, I'm an amazingly slow learner, um, but it doesn't matter. It does not matter. As long as you uh, persevere and have an idea and see it all the way through. If you're writing a tune, finish the tune. Um, very important to finish, to finish what you start. Uh, or if you can't finish it in a section of the tune, save it and glue it onto something else that you can't finish. Find a way to complete what you finish. Uh, whether it's practicing or writing, that way you can move forward. But if you if you kind of have to do something and it just sits there, it's very hard because you accumulate all this garbage. It's hard to sift your way out of it and move forward. Um, so it's very important to, uh, you know, in my case it works to set little little things like the arpeggios right now. That's what I'm going to mess around with for the next uh, few months once I get a chance to practice. And then we'll turn it into something. But you know, I'll just zero in on that and a few other things, and, and I'm happy with that. Uh, rather, I'm not trying to, you know, uh, sort of uh, reinvent, improvise. I'm just, I'm satisfied with small growth, particularly at this age. Um, so I think, I don't know, I think we did it. I think we, we did it. Yeah, we're gonna get some rest and a sandwich, yes. Thank you.